real in my confused and rattled. Yes, Mr. Davy. My lord, my ladies, I appear on behalf of the appellant. My learned friend, Mr. Collins QC, appears on behalf of the respondent. Clearly, you have um, very full and detailed skeleton arguments from, from both of us. I was proposing to uh, deal with my submissions in the order that I've set them out in my skeleton argument. Yes. Uh, before dealing with each of the individual issues, I, I just wanted to deal with a few issues of background so that the picture is clear to this court. Um, both the questions of non billable duty and vicarious liability depend ultimately on a proper understanding of the relationships between the various entities involved in this case. It depends on an understanding of the nature of the businesses operated, firstly by the practice, the appellant, and also the nature of the businesses operated individually by the associates. Uh, undoubtedly, commercial enterprises are free to set up their businesses in whatever way they want. Uh, if a business chooses to set itself up as providing premises and facilities in exchange for a fee, then they're entitled to do so. Similarly, if a business chooses to set itself up uh, entering into contracts not to provide a service itself, but to make arrangements for that service to be provided by a third party, then again, it's entitled to do so. So a court analysing these questions needs to look in detail at the specifics of exactly how the various entities had set themselves up and what the nature of the relationships between them were. As I've set out in paragraph two of my skeleton, the way that the appellant chose to set up his business was to be a provider of premises and facilities to associates who would then pay him a fee for the use of those premises and facilities. As a result of setting up his business in that way, it also enabled him to make arrangements for the associates to provide dental treatment. And as a consequence of that, he was able to enter into contracts such as the contract he entered into with the PCT. In terms of dental treatment itself, the only dental treatment that the appellant provided as part of his business was firstly any dental treatment that he himself provided. Uh, and although none of that, uh, none of the allegations of negligence relate to treatment he, that he provided, so this is essentially irrelevant for today's purposes. But the second uh, area in which dental treatment was provided as part of his business was in respect of any employees. So, for example, Dr. Khan, who was employed as a trainee, and therefore his, his treatment formed part of the, uh, part of the uh, work provided by the business. Other than that, the appellant says that the provision of dental treatment itself, as opposed to uh, arranging for third parties to provide that treatment, was no part of the practice's business. Now, the uh, respondent disputes this and says that the appellant's business was the, pro pro was the provision of the allegedly negligent dental services by the associates. Now, um, again, we do say that the key is to look in detail at precisely how the appellant's business was set up and operated and how it interacted with each of the associates' businesses. And although no single element is conclusive, we do say that every element is entirely consistent with the way that I've described the appellant's business. So firstly, the starting point is that it is agreed that the appellant owned the business and its equipment and also employed reception staff and dental nurses, but did not employ any dentists apart from trainees. That was how he'd structured his business. Uh, you can also see at uh, page 212 of a supplemental bundle, which is the Associates Agreement, uh, you can 
see the heading charge for license in, in point 25. In consideration for this license, the associate shall make payments to the practice owner in accordance with Schedule 2. So the contract specifically provided that associates would pay the appellant a license fee to cover the use of the premises, equipment, reception and nursing staff, and also to provide the appellant with an element of profit. And this is the 50%, is it? That, that is. And it, 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 if we turn to Schedule 2, you can see how it is all calculated. It starts with um, the performer's fee, page 221, sorry. So if we're looking at NHS for payments first, it starts with the performer's fee uh, from which lab costs would be deducted. That would be 50% of lab costs. Less bad debts, again, 50% of bad debts. Uh, uh, and then uh, any further bad debts, and then there was a subtotal, and less the license fee payable to the practice at the rate of 50%. Uh, and, and a similar sort of calculation is set out at the bottom section dealing with private payments. Just uh, one short point. At all times, um, Mrs. Hughes was an NHS patient. In respect of the relevant treatment, yes. Right. Uh, after the relevant treatment, she subsequently chose to receive some private treatment. But that's not strictly relevant to the, the allegations in this case. And it's common ground, isn't it, that the fact that the practice owner Dr. Ratton was himself a dentist is really neither here nor there. It could be the practice could could be owned by a partnership of one or more dentists, or it could be a company, couldn't it? That's absolutely correct. Um, and it wouldn't make any difference to the analysis of the, the relationship between the practice and an associate dentist, whether the practice was um, company, partnership. Absolutely. Um, you, you're absolutely right. Um, a, a, a limited company could enter into the contract that was entered into with the PCT. Uh, and crucially, if it did, then all interactions, so the contract with the associates would be the same, the uh, antecedent relationship between uh, the respondent and the practice, which would be a limited company, would be exactly the same. It just so happens that Dr. Ratton is a dentist, and it would have been open for him to do dental work uh, as part of that contract. And you'll recall the contract provided that either the contractor themselves could provide the treatment, or they could enter into contracts with subcontractors or associates for them to provide the dental treatment. And obviously in the situation of a limited company, that would be how they set up the business. Is there any contract between the patient and the practice? Or indeed the, between the patient and anyone? Uh, in the field of dental work, that's a, that's a difficult question. Certainly it didn't form any part of the case. Um, it wasn't part of any pleaded case. Uh, it wasn't suggested it, it was. It, it, in respect of private treatment, we would say the position is undoubtedly clear that the patient enters into a contract with the person offering the service, which in this case would be the associate. They would offer the, they would offer the treatment, uh, they would set the price of the treatment. Well, the, so the, 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 the patient would sign, sign a document, wouldn't she, for private treatment. Which, which would set it all out. So, Absolutely. But but for an NHS patient, certainly in this case, there was no such document. Well, just to be absolutely clear, um, NHS patients, as part of the uh, GDS contract, 
one of the requirements is for a, a dental treatment plan to be given to the patient. And perhaps if I can deal with that. The well, before we look at that, what you, when, when I asked you the, the question, you smiled and said it's a difficult question, but what's the well, answer? <laughs> Well, the, 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 I, I, if you forgive me, just to explain, part of the reason why it's difficult is that any payment made in respect of uh, NHS treatment is a, is a fee just like a prescription charge. It's one of the few areas where in, uh, in order to access NHS treatment, you have to pay a fee. It's yeah. one of those areas. And, and it's on that basis that we would say in respect of NHS treatment, there is no contract, certainly not between patient and either the associate or the practice. And you'll, you'll note that there's no, uh, there's no pleading, there's no suggestion no, no. from my learned friend that there was. Yeah. Well, perhaps if there had been, we wouldn't be here now, Mr. Davey. Absolutely. So, um, turning then to the issues of background, unless there's any other issues that I can assist with. At well, this you, were, you, you, uh, before I interrupted you, 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 you said the GDS contract requires the patient to be given a dental treatment plan. You were about to turn to something, so that's. Well, I can deal with that that now. If you turn to page 82 of the supplemental bundle, uh, page 80, it's actually at the bottom of page 81, there's a reference to treatment plans. And reference to where the contractor agrees to provide a course of treatment to a patient, it shall at the time of the initial examination and assessment of that patient uh, ensure that the patient is provided with a treatment plan. Is and course of treatment a defined term? It, it, it is. Uh, I think it's defined at the outset. Uh, page 56. Well, 55 says where no treatment plan has been provided, etc., etc. So, well, you, I think you said there must be a treatment plan, but this anticipates no treatment plan. Sorry, page 56, the reference to course of treatment. 55A, a course of treatment means that, little one, where no treatment plan. I think that's dealing with the term complete and uh, dealing with what is meant by a complete course of treatment. 56 deals with the, the definition of course of treatment itself and that it in essence involves the examination, uh, the identification of proposed treatment and then the provision of that planned treatment. Alright, so 47, where the contractor agrees to provide a course of treatment the contractor is, is Dr. Ratter, it's not an individual dentist. That's correct. And there are numerous references in the GDS contract to contractor providing dental treatment to the patient. Yes. But crucially, the contract also enabled the practice to discharge its contractual obligation by arranging for subcontractors or associates to in fact provide the treatment. What? Now as a, as a matter can you, of... Can you show us that? A 
also begin at 122, persons who perform services. That defines who can provide the services. There's actually a specific provision. Um, I think it's one. I'm not <coughs> sure if this is the provision you're looking for. Let me say that at once. But 184 envisages the contractor employing or engaging a dental practitioner to perform dental services under the contract. Y yes. Uh, but I'm not sure that is the provision it, you're looking for. Th there is another provision that sets out um, the express permission. And I... And then there's the subsequent provisions that deal with the limits on that. If I can just look at that. I didn't have the reference because it was accepted by the judge in her judgment. Yes, but unless I'm mistaken, and I could easily be, she doesn't actually identify the clause she in doesn't. this contract. No. Because I looked for it.
part of this performance contract, which um, talks about the performance. Um, They're one of the defined terms at the outer. Yes. And then part 12, um, at 122. Mm. Thank you. you'd like to show us from the GBS contract? Uh, no, it was just to point out that the provisions of the GBS contract specifically require that there be a dental treatment plan setting out the course of treatment that should be provided to the patient and it sets out what needs to be on that, that dental treatment plan. And in particular, um, it specifically requires in the contract that the name of the contractor needs to be on the dental treatment plan. So that is why, even though the treatment is provided by uh, the associates as a result of subcontracting the work to the associates, uh, the contractor's name is on the dental treatment plan. And so, I just, is that significant or not? Well, we say not. And in due course, I, I thought you said that all, all this contractual documentation is completely irrelevant to anything. We shouldn't really be looking at it at all. Absolutely. Um, it's irrelevant for two reasons. One, it's not part of the antecedent relationship between the practice and the respondent. And, and secondly, in any event, what we're looking at is the nature of any assumption of responsibility at the time that an appointment is made. What we're not looking at, because it wasn't part of uh, Clement's case and it's not part of the judge's judgment, is whether there was any subsequent assumptions of responsibility. We need to look at the antecedent relationship as at the time of booking. The Clement's case and what the judge found was at the time of booking, that made the patient made the individual a patient of the practice and, and meant that the practice had assumed a duty of care in respect of the provision of dental treatment at that point. That was, what, that was how the case was put, that was how the judge found. So to that extent, what is done subsequently as a result of the associate having examined the patient and reached a conclusion as to a course of treatment it is irrelevant that prior question of what is the antecedent relationship at that point in time. So those are the two reasons I say it's irrelevant. Why, why, is, why is clause 47 irrelevant? where the contractor, that's Dr. Ratt, agrees to provide a course of treatment to a patient, it, he, shall, at the time of the initial examination and assessment, ensure that the patient is provided with a treatment plan on a form which specifies the name of the patient, the name of the contractor, the place at which doesn't say it has to say which individual is going to provide the service. But what, why, why is all this irrelevant? Well, it's irrelevant to the question of non delegable duty because the question of non delegable duty deals with the question of the assumption of responsibility of the practice at the relevant time. And the relevant time, both as in the way that the claim has been put and also in the judge's judgment, was at the time of the appointment being made. That's the 
That's the essence of the, the, the claimant's case. Isn't that the point at which the contractor is agreeing to provide a course of treatment? Because the treatment starts with an examination by the dentist to see what is necessary. No, that so at that point, uh, having made an appointment with the practice, or, or gone to the practice to, make a, to, to see a dentist, isn't there then a clause 47 obligation to provide the course of treatment that follows? Well, course of treatment can only follow from an examination, and an examination can only follow from an appointment. What, what the claimant's case is that it, the mere booking of the appointment, a little bit like going into a hospital, when you, when you register and book at a hospital, the act of booking yourself into a hospital makes you a patient of the hospital and places the hospital under a duty of care to provide treatment at that point. Yeah, why isn't the same true here? Well, I, I say for a number of reasons. The, the, the first is that there is a significant difference between a hospital, which is a public body uh, obliged to provide treatment to anyone that walks through their door and that is accepted uh, as, a, uh, as part of a, a booking procedure. We are dealing with a practice, a commercial enterprise, who is entitled to set itself up as providing dental services itself, but equally is entitled to set itself up as a business, not providing dental treatment, but making arrangements for the provision of dental treatment by third parties. But what does, what does the claimant know of this? The, claim, the claimant turns up at reception and says, I want to see a dentist. Let's l l leave the question of choice for the, the moment. That, that, The receptionist says you can see Dr. Fur, whoever it is. Um, ten minutes later, or half an hour later, or the next day, the claimant goes into consulting room number whatever and sees Dr. Fur. But surely she does so. Well, Dr. Fur is acting if clause 47 of the GDS contract is the meaning. Dr. Fur is acting on behalf of the contractor providing the course of treatment. I think it's important to separate out the contractual relationship between the PCT and the practice and all the obligations that go on in that field and any contractual or um, duty of care either between the respondent and the associate or between the respondent and the practice. They're in two entirely separate things. Uh, and just to take as an example, an extreme example, the contractor has an obligation to provide a number of units of dental activity. It can, it can achieve that obligation in two ways. It can either provide it himself, he could provide the dental treatment himself, or he can engage subcontractors. Um, that is a contractual obligation that, that he needs to meet in one of those two ways. It would be open to him to simply not provide any dental treatment at all. He could close the practice. He would be in breach of his contract with PCT. But he wouldn't have, it's, the, the agreement with the PCT doesn't in some way create a duty of care between him and anyone that presents themselves at his door. There are two entirely separate uh, obligations. And so, we say that that GDS contract is irrelevant to the question of the antecedent relationship between the, uh, the respondent and the appellant. The reality is that the respondent will have no knowledge of any, PC, any GDS contract. Will have the claimant. The, the claimant yeah, will have yeah. no knowledge yeah. of uh, any GDS contract. Will have probably no knowledge of any agreement that the practice has reached with the associates. The fact is, the respondent does not know how this business, this practice, has chosen to discharge its responsibilities and has decided to, to provide dental treatment. And so there's essentially a vacuum. She doesn't know whether the practice has agreed to provide her <coughs> with the treatment, or whether it's the associate providing her with the treatment. She may well have an expectation, a belief, 
that this is all one and the same enterprise, yeah. just a single business. Yeah. But but as um, as a judge found, if you turn to page ninety one. Paragraph 112. She said, I agree with Mr. Davy that the claimant's own perception that she was at all times a patient <coughs> of the practice does not in itself carry weight. As Lord Justice Dyson observed in Farage, the subjective expectations of particular patients would be an unacceptably um, uncertain and unprincipled basis for determining whether a non delible duty of care existed. Expectations would vary from patient to patient. However, the factors that gave rise to Ms. Hughes' perception, specifically those I've identified in the preceding paragraph, are themselves relevant objective indicators that she was, for present purposes, a patient of the practice. Now, the, the crucial issue in the, is whether, as a matter of the antecedent relationship, what was done, what was said, what interactions there were, and that's set out in the previous paragraph. The practice had assumed a duty of care to provide her with dental treatment, mm. rather than a duty to make arrangements for dental treatment to be provided. Yeah. And the reality is she wouldn't know which of those two it was. And I do say it would be wrong to simply assume, effectively impose a default position, that the default position, in the absence of anything positive pointing one way or the other, the default position is it's one on and the same enterprise, and that the practice is therefore deemed or assumed to be uh, accepting a duty of care to provide dental treatment. But that's not the basis of the judge's judgment. She identifies some objective indicators that combined to lead the claimant. Uh, to expect and the judge to to um, conclude that there was a, a, an antecedent relationship that gave rise to an indelible duty. And all those indicators were all about the way in which the practice operated vis-a-vis -vis the patient. You, you've talked a lot about the way the practice sets itself up vis-a-vis associate dentists and in relation to its obligations to the PCT. But what matters here is it's how it behaved towards and its relationship with the patient. I, I didn't entirely agree. That what matters here is how it behaves and acts towards the patient. And that's the first error because the judge did reach the conclusion that there was an assumption of responsibility to provide dental services but did so partly on the basis of the interactions between the patient and the practice, but also on the basis of the GDS contract and the associate's agreement. Well, because those were plainly also relevant. Well, I, I, I say that was an error and that she shouldn't because what she should have been looking at is the interactions, the antecedent relationship between the practice and the patient. In terms of the antecedent relationship between the practice and the patient, that's effectively fully set out in paragraph 111, paragraph yeah. the preceding paragraph. Those are the four factors yeah. that yeah. she relied on. And I say, looking at those four factors, those are equally consistent with the practice making arrangements for the provision of dental treatment by a third party. Well, how do you, how, how do you say that? Do we have the, the personal dental treatment? just taking it from clause 47 of the, uh, of the contract, uh, the standard contract. Uh, at trial, we did have a copy. The way, uh, what happened was that in cross-examination of the defendant, uh, he referred to the dental treatment plan. As a result, I think it was overnight, a, per, a sample personal treatment plan. This is a standard form document yes. that was produced. Uh, do, and then do, that do, was... Do we have the standard? Uh, it's not in the bundle. Or, well, it, it doesn't matter, but it either the the, the contractor, um, it may not matter, but um, the contractor is stated as either um, Manor Park Medical Practice or 
Dr. Rajendra Ratan trading as absolutely uh, and one or other. It, 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 um, as per the requirements, yes. his name or yes. the practice's name well, is at the top of the form. Yes. So she is t she's handed a document saying you will be provided with treatment by the Manor Park practice, say, or Dr. Ratton um, uh, trading as the Manor Park practice. If anybody in court has the document, it would be helpful to check. But it says one or other of those things. It doesn't say you will be provided with a course of treatment by Dr. Fur or Dr. Bogdana or whatever the other ones are called. Well, just to be clear, if you turn to page 75 and paragraph 50. Sorry, uh, 75 of, of the call bar. Of, of the call bar, yes. So the personal tr dental treatment plan is what we've ref seen referred to in the contract, had a specific contractual requirement for the contractor's mm. name to be included yeah. on the document. Oh, it's um, a, a, it's a rubber stamp. It, it was a rubber stamp, yeah. but um, yes. it was in fact used for convenience. It was only required for the NHS patients because it was part of the contract. It was required for their purposes. Yes. But in fact, it was used for private patients as well. The top of the form has fields for providers' details. I think it's actually contractors' details. Um, the contractor, uh, Mr. Ratton, would confirm it was his stamp that would be there. Mm. Under the field for inclusion of the patient's details, the text read, the dentist named on this form is providing you with a course of treatment information regarding your NHS dental treatment is detailed over leave. But just to be clear, the contractor's stamp is on it, but then it also refers to the dentist. Uh, the dentist named on this form is providing you with a course of treatment. Information regarding your NHS dental treatment is provided over leave. And the judge relied on that, uh, 111, it's one of the four factors at page 91. Hmm. Now, just to be clear of the circumstances in which this document arose, it, it, it arose as a result of cross-examination at trial. It wasn't a matter that had ever been read, uh, raised. It's not a matter that's pleaded. There's no suggestion in the pleadings in relation to any duty of care arising out of interactions between the associates and the claimant during the consultations. The it, it arose because of cross-examination where it was mentioned. And so the next morning, a sample form was produced and handed up to the court. And that's why it was referred to in the judgment. Yes, but whether, however it came about. So what? Yeah, yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, the, the reason for, is this. That is not the claimant's case. The claimant's case is not that the assumption of a duty of care to provide dental treatment arose when she was handed this particular form at the consultation with the associate. The claimant's case, and we can, we can turn to the pleaded case if it exists, it's page 103 in paragraph 2. Yes. The pleaded case is that the non delegable duty of care arose out of two matters, and two matters only. The fact that A, the defendant was the owner of the practice, and B, the fact that the claimant was a patient of the said practice. Yes. Uh, and we can see how the case was, was put at, at first instance. Page 85, paragraph 92. This is in relation to the, the key issue in relation to non delegable duty of care and the, the, the nature of any duty of care assumed by the practice. Mr. Collins submitted that the second fact was established that the treatment she received from the treating dentist was provided in the context of the claimant's antecedent relationship with the practice, which placed her in the care of the defendant. Whilst the defendant was not under a duty to accept Mrs. Hughes as a patient, once she'd completed the formalities that the practice required her to do so in order to receive treatment, the defendant assumed responsibility for her care. Hmm. And the judge uh, 
said as follows at page 91, paragraph 113. Uh, the last sentence. Further, once Mrs Hughes had booked an appointment with the practice and completed the formalities required of her by reception staff, she was a patient of the practice for the purposes of receiving dental treatment, which the defendant provided pursuant to the GDS contract. So th that is at all times the claimant's case and what the judge found, which is that the assumption of responsibility occurred, like in a hospital, at the time of the booking procedure. So going to reception and booking the appointment. There was no suggestion. There's no, not pleaded. There's, there's no... But once she, she's booked and completed the formalities, there is an agreement to provide a course of treatment. The course of treatment may not have started, but there's an agreement to provide it. Uh, we, say, we say not. Why? Clause 47 says it. Clause 47, where the contractor agrees to provide a course of treatment, then there shall be an initial examination, an assessment, etc., etc. The point remains that this is part of the obligations between the practice and the PCT. It, it cannot and should not form part of any antecedent relationship that can give rise to a duty of care between the appellant and the respondent. Why? Because a, a duty of care can only arise out of the interactions between the two parties. But, but we're now in a situation where she's gone to the practice, She's completed all the formalities, she's got an appointment, and she's about to receive the course of treatment that she has agreed, that it's been agreed will be provided, that will commence with an initial examination by the associate dentist. Why, why isn't it relevant to look at that? Well, to consider it as part of the you said it's been agreed that she would receive a course of treatment. In fact, she hasn't agreed that. That is part of the agreement between the contractor and the PCT. Yeah. The, the reality of the interactions between the claimant and the practice at the time she's booked in for an appointment is that she's done nothing more than turn up, ask to see a dentist, had an appointment booked. That's it. Well, she ne she's, she's at the point at which a course of treatment will be provided to her by one of the associate dentists in accordance with clause 47 of PCT contract. Isn't there a stepping process on this? She books in for the appointment and then by one means or another the dentist who is going to assess her in the first instance is identified. Is it the case that only when that dentist has examined the patient that he or she can then determine what the treatment plan is? And it is, is it at that point the treatment plan comes into existence? Absolutely. There is no treatment plan until the appointment, until after the examination, after identifying what the proposed course of treatment will be, and that's then written down on the dental treatment plan, and that is when uh, she would be handed the dental treatment plan. Because yeah. at the time of the appointment, whatever the patient, if I can call her that, believes may be her problem, no one knows what treatment she is required until she's been examined and assessed by a dental practitioner. And it is at that point, following that examination and assessment, or possibly further investigations, that the treatment plan comes into existence. Practically, is that it? That's correct. And to look at another scenario, when she presents herself to the practice and is booked in for an appointment, the practice also has no idea, and there'll be no discussion, as to whether it's going to be She's, she may be intending to have completely cosmetic treatment that's not available on the NHS. Yeah. So uh, at that point, um, I, I simply do 
would argue that it's not possible to say that the GDS contract has any relevance. A patient in identical circumstances with identical antecedent relationships at that point, in terms of the practice and the uh, and, and the response, it's absolutely identical, and they've no idea whether she's going to receive private or uh, NHS treatment, or in fact, no course of treatment at all. There may be simply requires an examination. It's identified that she doesn't require a course of treatment. And I understand that, but why? Why is the personal treatment plan, which has to be given to her before the actual treatment as opposed to the examination begins, why is it irrelevant that that document tells her that the dentist named on this form, that is Mr. Ratton, is providing the course of treatment? Um, my, my first reason is that that isn't part of the claimant's case and it's, that is significant because if it had been part of the claimant's plead case that they were relying on representations whether made in writing or orally at, at some later stage so for example by the associates during the consultations if that had been the claimant's case well then we'd have had an opportunity to respond to that this is just a single document that, that has been presented. We don't know, for example, what conversations took place between the associates and, uh, and the respondent. The reason we don't know that is because it hasn't formed any part of this case. This document didn't arise because someone saw its relevance, identified it, thought it was part of the relevant to the pleaded case, and, and, and brought it to the court. The pleaded case it is that the duty of care arose at the time of the booking process. That was what we were responding to. So um, if we'd been responding to a different case, then clearly we'd have been able potentially to call the associates to deal with the oh, discussion. I say, Mr. Davey, I mean, a preliminary issue was um, directed uh, in the, it's the first document in, in the supplement. Um, the, the issue of whether the defendant is liable to the claimant for the acts and omissions of the four treating dental surgeons should be determined as a preliminary issue. And there was an order for disclosure in respect of all documents in their possession in relation to the preliminary issue of whether the defendant is liable for the acts of four omissions of the associate dentist. Surely the personal treatment should have been disclosed as number one on the on on that list of documents. All documents were disclosed. A personal treatment plan didn't form part of those documents. The evidence only arose because Mr. Ratton said, said that as a matter of standard procedure, this is what should happen. Well, shouldn't you have disclosed it? Is the point my lord is making? We we it, it wasn't part of well, the. Well, it should have been, shouldn't it? Well. All of the patient's records were disclosed. But not the treatment plan. But there wasn't a treatment plan within the records. So now, there wasn't a treatment plan in front of you? Is that what you're Well, saying? it didn't form part of this case. There was no investigation into the treatment plan. The first time anyone raised the issue of a treatment plan was in cross-examination of Mr. Ratta. And it's in response to that that he raised that it would be the standard process. What should happen is that the patient is given a dental treatment plan at the time of the course of treatment commencing. That's what should happen. There wasn't one in the patient's records. That's as far as we could get. And, and to, to assist the court, a standard form document was provided the next day. And that's what that document said. But surely the standard form, the fact that um, uh, the personal treatment plan names the owner of the practice as the dentist who will provide the treatment is is relevant. I, mean, I appreciate you 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 say it's not conclusive, and you're 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 giving arguments as to why it's not. But um, it can't possibly be said that this was not a disclosable document. The difficulty is that 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 document was not part of the patient's record. No, but the standard form document. We're, we're, 
if it, it, says would, be very dis- it would be very disappointing if this important case on which leave was given to the court uh, for an appeal to the Court of Appeal were to turn on the terms of the particulars of claim and whether the personal treatment plan was mentioned. Um, uh, so that this rather important issue would then, it, it, if you're right, the judge should have said, well, it's nothing about the personal treatment plan in the particular particulars of claim. Um, so if you, Mr. Collins, are going to rely on it, you'll have to amend the particulars of claim and will have to be an adjournment and so on. None of this happened. You're, are you really saying that, that um, it, it, it's critical that the personal treatment plan was not mentioned in the particulars of claim? What I do say is that the claimant's case is that the assumption of responsibility and a duty of care arose at the time of the booking procedure, well before any question of a dental treatment plan arose. That's but she'd had loads of other treatments. There was an antecedent relationship, that's what this is all about. She'd had treatments before and she'd had dental treatment plans before, and all of them, presumably, had named Mr. Rattan, Dr. Rattan, as the dentist providing the treatment, consistently with Clause 47. I'll be correct if I'm wrong, but I think the allegations relate to from the first appointment. But I'll be correct if I'm wrong, but the, 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 the essence is that the claimant's case was it was the booking, the making of the appointment, the equivalent to being in a hospital that created that um, assumption of responsibility. And, and in terms of the, the relevance of this, this dental treatment plan, I do have to raise it because it, because of the way in which this document arose. It wasn't part of anyone's case. It, it arose because it was provided but, but, by, by the claimant. But, but whether or not it was within the particular patient records, a preliminary issue that went wider than the particular patient was being determined. And if there was a relevant document that dealt with the question of treatment and the way in which and who provides the treatment, <laughs> It should have been disclosed. It was plainly relevant. It may not, as my lord has said, have been determinative, but it was plainly relevant. You should have disclosed it. My lady, we didn't consider it to be relevant. My learned friend, who in fact provided the document to the court the next day through his solicitors, they were, they would be aware of this potential document, and they didn't think it was relevant didn't form part of their case, whether it was pleaded, um, it, it wasn't far, part of any of the evidence that was put forward. And, and I entirely accept that that is um, unsatisfactory, but that's where we were. Right, well unsatisfactory as it is, given what the judge has set out in paragraph 50, you have said that there was a stamp on the dental, or the evidence was that there would be a stamp on the dental plan naming Mr. Ratton as the dentist. Is it any part of your case that on that dental plan there would have been another name for the associate providing the treatment? I, 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 can't, I can't say that because of the, the way this document has, has arisen. Does anybody have this famous document? Um, yes. I, either the actual one or a standard one. Um, the, we heard there wasn't an actual one available in the records no. from the uh, defendants. Mm. The standard form is in existence. I've seen it electronically behind me. We can get it printed up at lunchtime if that's fine. Yes, if, if, if you could. All right, Mr. David, I think you should assume um, that we're against you if you're trying to say that we can't look at this uh, uh, document, or or or, or the or that the judge was um, not entitled to refer to it in paragraph fifty. So shall we, shall we m- move on on that basis? Certainly, my lord. Um, going then back to the what I say is the relevant uh, parts of the background. Uh, I, I've already dealt with the issue of the license fee that was arranged. Uh, as we've seen, we've. 
identified how the license fee was calculated in terms of the deductions that were made. Um, crucially, it was an agreed fact uh, that each associate had complete clinical control over the dental treatment provided. So the appellant had no control over precisely the thing that is said by the respondent to be what his business was providing. Um, in addition, as the judge found, it would, and perhaps if we can turn to page 73, yes. paragraph 38, uh, it notes the practice owner, and this is clause 17, the practice owner may introduce to the associate patients desirous of NHS dental treatment or advice endeavour to introduce sufficient patients to allow the associate to meet the UDA commitment defined in clause 19. However, the defendant decided not to include a specific UDA commitment in the agreement as he was confident that he would be able to meet the UDA target hours prescribed by the UDS contract without having to do so. So the effect of that w was that he was not obliged, there was no contractual obligation to provide any level or any level at all of uh, of work to the associates mm -hmm. it also meant that the associates were completely free to uh, do exactly or as little work as, as they wanted to including doing no work at all it, it also meant that they were free to work whatever hours they wished And the obvious consequence is that even if work was provided to them, there was no obligation on them to, to accept it. Now, um, in addition, the associates were entirely free to choose whether to do NHS or private work, and if so, uh, how that would be divided up. The associates could choose which lab they used for work, and, and the effect of that is that different labs charge different fees. So the, uh, the associates profit would depend on which lab they chose. If they chose a particularly expensive lab that produced great work, maybe that would be useful for their reputation, but it would obviously reduce their profit in respect to that individual piece. All of this is relevant to the vicarious liability point, right. but not to the non-delegable. That's correct. I'm, I'm just dealing with all of the relevant background in one go, yes. uh, so that you can understand the nature of the relationship. Uh, in terms of insurance or indemnity, the associates were obliged to uh, arrange their own indemnity cover. Uh, the appellant's business indemnity cover didn't at the time uh, provide cover in respect of any dental treatment provided by the associates. And in fact, at the time, no such uh, indemnity uh, was available on the market. Now, just to be clear, that position changed last year and the appellant's indemnity provider has agreed to retrospectively provide an indemnity. But in terms of identifying what the, the, the arrangements were, how the businesses were set up at the relevant time, I do say that's a relevant factor. Uh, is it right that individual dentists have to have professional <laughs> indemnity? That's correct. Uh, was that certainly so now? Was it so at the time of the Absolutely. Law? In addition, the associate was responsible for the expenses required in order to provide uh, dental treatment. Uh, so, for example, they had to pay the license fee. They had to pay all their professional costs. They paid for accountants, CPD, journals, and so on. So, just by way of illustration, take into extreme what the actual agreement between the associates and the practice meant is that the associate could choose to do no dental work at all, uh, was free to work at, at another practice instead. If they chose to do any work, they chose how much uh, and when they did it. And the appellant had no control over any of the treatment that they provided. And if they chose to provide treatment, they made decisions that determined what profit they made, and they potentially faced the risk of making a loss in respect of uh, any particular item of treatment. And in addition, they're responsible for all of the professional expenses associated with running the business. So, uh, and again, this is obviously relevant to the issue of vicarious liability. I say taking into all those matters into account, if the question is asked, 
what was the business of the associates? I do say that the clear answer is that they each operated their own business providing dental treatment. And the relevance of that is I, I say if you ask the same question, well, what was the appellant's business? We say that all of the elements that made the provision of dental treatment the associate's business were lacking when you look at the appellant. So that's the relationship between the associates and the practice. Then turning to the interactions between the respondent and the practice. Just to be absolutely clear, contrary to what the respondent stated in her statement and what is set out in paragraph 11 of my learned friend's skeleton, she, she didn't choose, uh, she did in fact choose, or at least try to choose, which dentist treated her. And just to be clear, it's paragraph page 76. So firstly, as the judge found at paragraph 56 in the second sentence, at one point she specifically asked to be seen by a single dentist. And from that point on, she was in fact only seen by a single dentist. So she, she did have control and choice in relation to that uh, and in fact uh, she also accepted that when she first attended at the practice she'd asked to be specifically treated by a particular dentist um, I think who'd been re recommended to her but they weren't available so a different dentist had to be selected so that's relevant to the question of the control and freedom that she had as to who if anyone provided her with dental treatment um, Again, as found by the judge, on attendance, she completed a medical history form and not a registration form. <laughs> she was never registered with the practice in the sense of having a right to return. Uh, any interactions, I say, well, between... Well, she was never registered with the practice in the sense of having a right to return. What, what well, certainly the old <laughs> arrangement between dental practices used to be that they would have a list of patients and they would be registered with the practice, and that gave them a right to uh, ongoing treatment with that particular practice. That position changed. Now patients are entirely free to go to whichever practice they want. They're not registered with the practice. They attend a practice, they ask for an appointment, an appointment is made, and then it's at the appointment that they will be offered a course of treatment, and if it's accepted, then that course of treatment starts and that is provided by um, at that particular practice. That was also, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. That was also related to payment, wasn't it? Because it, under the old system, there was a per capita payment which dentists could claim, and that's why registration was important. But then the whole system of payment changed, so the registration wasn't required for the per capita payment. That, that's correct, and it changed to a, a UDA system yeah. where for each for each item of work that was in fact done or arranged to be done, they received a payment. And that's when, a reference when, to when, when, was the, when was the change made? Can you just give me, give me a year? Around 2005, I'm told, but right. I don't think we can be too precise. So now the system which um, I lady described is still still a position with GPs, medical practices. You're, you are registered with one GP's practice, one practice. Um, uh, you can't be registered with more than one, and you have certain rights to be treated, uh, and so on. That was the position for dentists till around 2005, but is no longer. That's correct. Although, in respect of GPs, I'm not clear as to how that may or may not affect the funds or the payment that they receive. So, um, what, what I do say is that the, the interactions between the practice and the appellant were entirely administrative in nature. They were responsible for making the appointments, they were responsible for dealing with payment, and I say that is entirely consistent with the business of the practice being the provision of premises and facilities. And um, as we've already discussed, at the time of presenting to the practice, 
and the appointment being booked, the practice would have no idea what treatment, if any, would be offered, uh, and in particular whether it be NHS or private treatment. Uh, and lastly, the respondent was entirely free at any time to refuse treatment offered or to simply choose to go to a different practice. So, again, by way of illustration, taken to its extreme, you could have a scenario of an individual wanting private teeth whitening. They could have attended with a recommendation and request to see a particular dentist. They attend at the practice asking to see that specific dentist. They have an appointment made for them. At the appointment, there's a discussion about the proposed cosmetic treatment. The associate would offer them a price. They would then decide whether to accept that and go ahead with the treatment. They could refuse. They could ask to see a different dentist. They could choose to go to a different practice. Um, that is the, a, a potential scenario. And it will be suggested that, that the facts of that scenario, in particular the nature of the treatment chosen, is very different to the nature of the treatment that was offered in, in this case. However, I do say that crucially the interactions and inter antecedent relationship between the appellant and the individual would be the same in terms of the booking of the appointment, the collection of fees, and so on, regardless of what was in fact done. The only difference, the only difference would be in relation to the dental treatment plan provided. So with that background in mind, turning then to the question of non-delible duty. And I say the starting point is that the term non-delible is, is slightly misleading. The reality is that if the defendant owes a, a common law duty of care, the duty can't be delegated. It, it is either discharged or it's breached. And, and normally, you can discharge a duty by either fulfilling it or by delegating the task to someone else. Now, um, Lord Justice Dyson summarised that general rule and the exception uh, of a non-delible duty in Farage, which is at page 168 of the Authorities Bundle. Six, eight, and it's at the very bottom, paragraph 97. Uh, he said, the general rule is an important feature of our law of negligence. It recognises that the duty to take reasonable care may be discharged by entrusting the performance of a task to an apparently competent independent contractor. As Mr. Justice Mason pointed out in uh, the Condis case, uh, the concept of a personal non-delible duty is a departure from the basic principles of liability and negligence by substituting for the duty to take reasonable care a more stringent duty, namely a duty to ensure that reasonable care is taken. In my view, any departure from the general rule must be justified on policy grounds. If the position were to be otherwise, there is a danger that the general rule would become the exception rather than the rule. As I understand it, that is not our law. So, for a non-delegable duty to uh, arise, there must be more than just a, a normal duty to take reasonable care. It is a positive duty to protect the individual from harm. And in addition to being a positive duty, a non-delegable duty is a personal one. And personal doesn't mean that the defendant must do the task themselves, and if they fail to do so, they're in breach. Personal merely means that contrary to that general rule, if they delegate the task, they will not have discharged their duty. So it's a guarantee. They're guaranteeing that the duty will be performed, that, that care will be taken. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, those points were summarised by uh, Lord Sumption in Woodland, if you turn to page 302. Uh, 
where he said the following. Uh, the second category of non-delegable duty is, however, directly in point. It comprises cases where the common law imposes a duty on the defendant which has three critical characteristics. First, it arises not from the negligent character of the act itself, but because of the, an antecedent relationship between the defendant and the claimant. Second, the duty is a positive or affirmative duty to protect a particular class of persons against a particular class of risks and not simply a duty to refrain from acting in a way that foreseeably causes injury. Third, the duty is, by virtue of that relationship, personal to the defendant. The work required to perform such a duty may well be delegable, and usually is, but the duty itself remains the defendant's. Its delegation makes no difference to his legal responsibility for the proper performance of a duty which is in law his own. And just then turning to uh, 304, paragraph 11 he said as follows in relation to the assumption of responsibility the duty to which Lord Blackburn was referring would today be regarded as arising from an assumption of responsibility imputed to the defendant by virtue of the special character of his relationship with the claimant the concept of an assumption of responsibility is usually relevant in the law of negligence as a tool for determining whether a duty of care is owed to protect against a purely economic loss. There is no doubt in this case that the education authority owed a duty of care to its pupils to protect them from injury. But the concept of assumption of responsibility is relevant to determine its scope, whether the potential loss is an economic or physical. The circumstances must be such that the defendant can be taken not just to have assumed a positive duty, but to have assumed responsibility for the exercise of due care by anyone to whom he may delegate its performance. This is a markedly more onerous obligation. It's important to bear that in mind when we're deciding uh, uh, whether or not a, a duty was uh, established in this case. And he said uh, as follows in paragraph 12, halfway down that paragraph. It does not, however, follow from the mere existence of a positive duty that it is also personal to the defendant so as to make it non-delegable. In the nuisance or quasi-nuisance cases, the personal character, character of the duty defend results, as I have pointed out, from the fact it arises from the defendant's occupation of the land from which the hazard or originates. In other cases, the personal character of the duty must be derived from something else. Both principle and authority suggest that the relevant factors are the vulnerability of the claimant, the existence of a relationship between the claimant and the defendant by virtue of which the latter has a degree of protective custody over him and the delegation of that custody to another person. And in due course, we'll, we'll see that, that um, those points formed part of the five characteristics that were subsequently identified and might help identify what is meant by those five characteristics. But as Lord Sumption pointed out, that there must essentially be three key elements. The first is that the relevant duty must arise from the relationship between the appellant and the respondent, not from their relationship with third parties, and not from the nature of the task involved. Hmm. Secondly, the duty must be more than a duty to take care. It must be a positive duty. Sorry, sorry Mr David, are, are you... Are you reading from the I'm not, and draw summary. This is my summary of both paragraphs. Okay, can you... Can, um, Starting uh, again, then? Start the, three, again. the three key elements yes. from those extracts are, firstly, that the relevant duty must arise from the relationship between the appellant and the respondent, not from their relationship with third parties and not from the nature of the task involved. Secondly, the duty must be more than a duty to take care. It must be a positive duty. Thirdly, the duty must be personal. And what makes it personal are the three key factors that were identified in that last section. The respondent being under the actual custody charge care of the appellant. respondent being especially vulnerable and dependent on the protection of the appellant from the risk of injury.
and the respondent having no control over how the appellant chooses to perform a particular task. And as I've said, those, those points comprise essentially the elements in the first three of the five criteria set out at page 312 uh, from C. Um, but for the reasons I've, I've set out in my skeleton, we don't need to consider the last two features. Um, so I'm purely going to focus on, on the first three. And I want to focus and start, as I do in my skeleton, by focusing on the second yeah. of the uh, five features. What that requires is to look at the antecedent relationship between the appellant and the respondent. That's the starting point. That's the factual basis on which the next two points are determined. Secondly, from that, consider uh, whether or not there was an assumption of a positive duty. And thirdly, to consider whether or not um, the respondent was under the actual custody charge or care of the appellant as I just outlined. Yeah. And that leads me to the first criticism that we make of the judge's decision, which is in respect of step one, she took into account uh, uh, matters which were not part of the antecedent relationship between the appellant and the respondent. In particular, she took into account the GDS contract and the associate contract. And, and the reason that's important is that the whole essence of a, a non delegable duty arises from the special nature of the relationship between the respondent and the appellant. And you, you cannot identify and you shouldn't be identifying that from, for example, obligations that are owed to others unless they have in some way affected the antecedent relationship between those two individuals. In this case, it was relatively straightforward. The entirety of the antecedent relationship, or at least the relevant points, are set out in those four bullet points. Uh, I think it's paragraph 110 yeah. of, of the judgment. That is what the judge should have focused on. Yeah. She didn't focus on that. She also took into account what we say are relevant matters in relation to obligations owed under the GDS contract and the relationship with the associates. If it were otherwise, the necessary consequence is that it would follow that depending on the nature of any obligation owed to an entirely separate third party, that could in some way affect the nature of the assumption of responsibility between two other individuals. That assumption of responsibility will always and can only arise out of the interactions and the antecedent relationship between those two individuals. So to, to give an example, uh, if, for example, there was an obligation to provide the service in a particular way, that wouldn't create a, a, a duty to provide the treatment in that particular way in respect of an individual patient. That would arise as in relation to the antecedent relationship, what was discussed, how it was offered, what was agreed on in terms of the course of treatment. There may be a mismatch. If they don't provide the treatment in the way that they've contractually agreed to with the PCT, then they'll be in breach of contract. But that doesn't affect what has in fact been agreed or what the assumption of responsibility is between the two individuals. And that's why we say it's irrelevant. What you need to focus on, as was expressly set out in Woodland, was the antecedent relationship between the respondent and the appellant. But that's my primary submission, is that the judge was wrong to take into account those additional matters. Uh, but in any event, it, even if it were determined that they, it was appropriate to take into account those relevant matters, uh, we say that the nature of the agreement was such as to mean that it provides no assistance as to the nature of any assumption of responsibility in respect of respondent. The simple fact is that what the appellant did is he didn't provide the treatment himself. He, he arranged and made arrangements for an independent contractor, the associates, to provide the treatment. That's what he did and he was entirely allowed to under the terms of the contract. 
and there's no dispute that he was entirely entitled to do so under the terms of the contract. So accordingly, even if it's suggested that the contract with the PCT is in some way relevant, it provides no assistance in terms of determining whether or not he'd assumed a responsibility to provide dental treatment or a responsibility to make arrangements for the provision of dental treatment. So that, that's my second ground as to why I say it was irrelevant to uh, look at the issue of the uh, GDS contract. And I make exactly the same point uh, in respect of paragraph 114 of the judgment at page 91, where the judge concluded that the arrangements with the associates supported her conclusion in relation to the assumption of a duty to provide dental treatment. same points can be made. The first is that it's irrelevant for the reasons I've identified. In any event, if you look at the nature of the agreement between the associate and the practice, there is nothing in there that suggests that there was an obligation on the, uh, on the practice to provide dental treatment. Each of the points that were relied on, if we turn to paragraph 114 and 1 to 5, All of those points merely confirm that the appellant had a contractual obligation with the associates to provide appropriate premises, to provide facilities, and so on. There is nothing in there that is inconsistent with the, the appellant's case that he was hit the nature of his business was to make arrangements for the provision of dental treatment. Is that, I can see that in relation to the first two um, points, but three, four, and five, all point to the patient being a patient of the practice, don't they? The, the dependent is responsible if the associate dentist doesn't complete the treatment, to complete the treatment, and the patient is part of the goodwill of the practice, not the associate dentist's goodwill. That's absolutely correct. And, and as I set out, the, the nature of the uh, practice's business was to provide premises and so on, yeah. uh, to associates. Now, for the purposes of attracting associates, it's necessary as part of that business mm -hmm. to have a number of people attending at the practice seeking dental treatment. So it's, a, it's in his business interest for there to be a number of people attending at the practice. So he wants to have patients of the practice. He certainly wants to, to have to individuals. To them as patients to associate dentists. Absolutely. He wants individuals to attend at the practice seeking dental treatment so that he can then make arrangements for that dental treatment to be provided. It's necessary in order to gain the license fee from the associates, and it's also necessary for him to, to get the fee from the PCT in respect of the GDS contract. So for both those reasons, it's in his business interest for there to be a, a way of retaining those uh, patients rather than allowing them to go elsewhere. So you say that just that's just part of administrative arrangements rather than... Treating. Well, it's, all, it, it's, in, it's entirely consistent with the way I've described his business, which is a business in which makes profit from making arrangements for the provision of dental treatment. Certainly not inconsistent. So that um, deals with the, what I say is the first uh, error made by the judge in, in using essentially the wrong factual starting point when making her decision on the scope of duty. Um, moving then to the question of applying the facts of the antecedent relationship to the question of the nature of the duty owed. Um, I, I, I've set out um, how the matter was dealt with. I completely understand, my Lord, um, the assumption I should make that the court is against me in relation to the relevance or, or the ability to consider uh, the dental treatment plan issue. Um, the part of uh, the judgment in which the judge considered the actual antecedent relationship is at pay paragraph 111. Yes. Point one to four. That's, in summary, the entirety, what we say, the entirety that could 
potentially form the basis of a conclusion of an assumption of a positive duty in respect of the claim. And put quite simply, putting to one side the question of the personal dental treatment plan, all of those matters, one to four, are entirely consistent with her approaching a business and that business making arrangements for the provision of dental treatment by a third party. There's no representation or, or anything else that could give rise to her being entitled to assume that actually the treatment is being provided by the practice itself. Well, as the judge said, that's no doubt what she assumed, but it's obvious. But um, uh, you, you, you say that one, one, one items one, two, three, and the NHS charge part of four are all consistent with either arrangement. Um, and the personal treatment plan. said when you look at it, but it is evidence that Mr. Ratton agreed to provide the treatment, the course of treatment. It's certainly one potential interpretation. If a patient receives that and reads it, that would certainly be one potential interpretation, and that would form part of the antecedent relationship. I have to entirely acknowledge that. Um, I do flag up the unfortunate way in which that evidence came out at trial. Um, and so to the extent that this court considers that it is relevant I can't, I can't provide any further details there's nothing in the judgment in relation to uh, what if anything else may have been discussed That deals, that Wood, deals. Woodland paragraph 23 is obviously very important. Is, is there anything else you, you, you want to say about it? Well, the, that, that's the second criticism. The third criticism uh, relates to the issue of the personal nature of the duty. And that incorporates the three elements that I've identified, one of which was within the second of the uh, Woodland criteria. I think the, the only point I, I can make in relation to the dental treatment plan is, is, first of all, just to be absolutely clear, that wasn't the basis on which the judge reached her conclusion. Her conclusion was based on the appointment being the creation of the assumption of responsibility. And I say that is wrong because um, the, the points at one to three and the first point at four don't allow that conclusion. The second point is, that there needs to be not just an assumption of an ordinary duty of care, but it needs to be an assumption of a positive duty. So a duty to protect from harm. And I do say, simply indicating that you would be the provider, if that was the antecedent relationship and that is the conclusion that should be drawn from the antecedent relationship, that would give rise to an ordinary duty of care. 
There's nothing about it that would give rise to, uh, to extend its scope into being a positive duty to, uh, to protect from harm. But that is what I say in relation to... But, but if, you're a, if you're a patient seeking dental treatment, you, you, you are in a very vulnerable position vis-a-vis -vis the dentist who knows um, or holds him or herself out as knowing what treatment to provide. And you've got no way of, again, saying what is recommended or proposed or uh, stopping the dentist from doing... From, from giving you bad or the wrong treatment. Doesn't that give rise to a positive duty to protect from harm in just the same way as a hospital has a positive duty to protect a patient seeking hospital treatment? Well, Why, why is it different? The, the, only, the only thing I would say is that there is a difference because um, in the case of a, of a dental practice, there can be any range of um, treatments that are being sought. It could be, for example, purely cosmetic treatment. It could be yes. teeth whitening. All right. Let, 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 but subject can, to... can we put those to one side? I, I can see that that, that, that is different. But the, that's not the present case. The, the only other crucial difference is that a patient attending at a practice, it, it's not like in a hospital where you attend and you know that the hospital is there and it will provide you, has an obligation to provide you with the treatment. Why? Why is well, the, if you go to the dentist for the treatment, they're there and you know they'll provide you with the treatment? Well, because it's a commercial enterprise, it's entirely in, would be open to it to enter into arrangements where it doesn't provide any dental treatment at all. But it makes arrangements for others to provide the dental treatment. That's the crucial distinction. But why, why does that affect whether it's... Uh, simply a duty to take care or, or a positive duty to protect from harm. We, we haven't come on to the hospital cases yet, but um, what, why is um, a patient attending the Manor Park dental practice any, any different from um, a, a, a patient attending a, a hospital outpatient clinic? Well, Two reasons. One is that the hospital is a public body with an obligation to provide the treatment itself. The practice is a business entity and has a choice as to whether it provides the treatment itself, whether it arranges for treatment to be provided by others. That's a, a key difference. I think the point is, well, if it has in fact indicated that it is going to provide the treatment itself, then I'd have to accept that distinction falls away. But it has. It has. I'm sorry to keep coming back to the personal treatment plan, but it's only evidence of um, uh, how, how the relationship evolved. The, the, the defendant has agreed to provide a course of treatment to the patient. Of course, he didn't have to. But why, why does why, why does it make a difference that a hospital? We think once it's accepted that um, patient X can attend. Hospital, I suppose, can't turn patient X away. But um, whereas a, a dental practice could in the first place, but what, once once the course of treatment has been agreed, what, why is it any different from a hospital outpatient? If, if it's <laughs> accepted and if it's found that he's in fact accepted responsibility to provide dental, dental treatment himself as opposed to make arrangements for the provision of dental treatment, then I agree. We'd be dealing with the, the same scenario. So everything depends on this first question. 
what has he agreed to? Is he agreeing to simply make the arrangements or is he agreeing to provide the dental treatment? That's correct. And, and, and I do say that the only factor that um, could be suggested that leads in the direction of him making some representation that could be part of an antecedent relationship giving rise to a, an assumption of responsibility to provide treatment himself is the dental treatment plan. And just to be clear, um, in respect to the dental treatment plan, I think it was suggested that he um, chose or he, he offered um, the dental treatment plan. Just to be clear, that's an obligation under the contract. He has to, and in fact the associates have to provide the dental treatment plan. It has to be his name, the contractor's name, on the top of the plan. He has no choice about that. It's a standard form document. He doesn't have a, a, an ability... But that's how all the NHS treatment is provided. A absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and just to be clear, even if he's entered into, as he's contractually entitled to do so, even if he's entered into arrangement with associates to provide the treatment, the contract requires him to fill in the form in that particular way. Which suggests that he is taking on a personal duty to provide the treatment. Well, well it suggests that... that, that At least it's consistent with it. It suggests that that is how the contract required him to present himself. And there's no... What, I mean, what, is there any other evidence or are there any other findings that you rely on? that lead to the conclusion that wasn't what he agreed to do. I know he's got a business um, arrangement and a commercial business to make profits out of making arrangements, but, but what we're concerned with, with the, 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 the presentation to patients, the practice presents itself as a dental practice offering treatment, and no doubt it's marketed in that way, and that's what what patients think when they go there. What, are there any indicators that you rely on, positive indicators, to show that that that, that was that's not what patients should under, have, have understood, and that they were positively told, or that they were they, there were indicators to show that all he was doing was making the arrangement. I think what we're looking at is: are there any positive indicators that would lead the other way? <coughs> yeah, and I think. In fairness, our argument has always been that it's entirely neutral. There, there, there haven't been Everything indicators either. Everything neutral apart from the treatment plan. Uh, absolutely. And the treatment plan arose in the way that it did. And part of the reason, it, having arisen in that way, there wasn't any further exploration as to whether there's any positive indicators in a different way. And I do say that the reason there wasn't any further exploration of that is because the nature of the claimant's case was that it arose from the outset. It arose from the making of the appointment. And so that was the case that we had to meet. That was the case that we met, and, and we say we did meet. The issue that has clearly been identified is the issue of the dental treatment plan, which arose um, in cross-examination of the defendant. All right. So <laughs> You've made that point. Um, and, and, and now we, 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 we need to get on. We're still on non-delegable uh, duty of care. Um, where do we go next on non-delegable duty of care? Well, then I think I can move to the, the other aspect of the second woodland factor. Yes. Which is whether or not the fact of the antecedent relationship uh, place the respondent in the actual custody, charge, or care of the appellant such that there was a sufficient element of control over the respondent. Now that is, as I've indicated, the first of the three elements that help to define a, a positive duty as also being a personal one, and therefore non-delegable duty. Uh, the other two um, are that the respondent must be especially vulnerable and dependent on the protection of the appellant against the risk of injury, and that the respondent has no control over how the duty is performed. But in terms of the issue of custody, charge, care, or control, um, just looking to see how that's been described, page 305 of the authorities bundle, uh, 
this was a section that we've already looked at. Lord Sumption, as you may recall, described it as a degree of protective custody. Three hundred five, paragraph twelve, last sentence. The existence of a relationship between the claimant and the defendant, by virtue of which the latter has a degree of protective custody over him. And then, just so that we can see the precise words that were used in the five criteria, it's three one twelve, three one two. And two one. The antecedent relationship must place the claimant in the actual custody, charge, or care of the defendant, and uh, and then notes at the bottom it is characteristic of such relationships that they involve an element of control over the claimant, which varies in intensity from one situation to another. Well, shouldn't one start with number one? I, understandably, in your skeleton argument, you focus on two. He begins with, the claimant is a patient or a child, or for some other reason, especially vulnerable. And he's not using patient in the um, 20th century terminology of meaning you know, some, somebody who's uh, sufficiently mentally um, unwell to require protection of the court of protection. He's, he's using patient in, 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 the, in the lay terminology, patient or doctor, dentist, etc. Isn't he? Well, I, I say he's using it as a, as a label for someone who's, uh, as he's indicated, uh, vulnerable or dependent on the protection of the defendant against the risk of injury, which for, for anyone attending hospital for treatment, obviously fall in that category. And anyone attending the practice, where the practice has agreed or is offering to provide med dental treatment, would also fall into that category. I say that... Yeah. That, that depends on your determination in relation to that first point. All right. So th there, is no, there is no dispute about that. The only reason that's raised as, as a dispute is because if it's accepted or if it was concluded that the uh, practice wasn't offering to provide dental treatment but was offering to arrange for dental treatment, then I say there is an issue as to whether or not they are a patient of the practice or if they're just a patient of the associate. But that depends on your conclusions on the first issue. So yes. I think we can move on. But clearly there are two separate requirements. One is to identify the vulnerability inherent in a claimant, in a, in a patient, and separately for there to be this element of custody, charge, or care, and the element of control. And uh, he said at 3, 1, 2, at H, uh, at the very bottom, where a non delegable duty arises, the defendant is liable not because he has control, but in spite of the fact that he may have none. The essential element, in my view, is not control of the environment in which the claimant is injured, but control over the claimant for the purpose of performing a function for which the defendant has assumed responsibility. And then at paragraph 25, He says, uh, this in respect of the justification as to why his criteria are appropriate. The criteria themselves are consistent with the long-standing policy of the law, apparent notably in the employment cases, to protect those who are both inherently vulnerable and highly dependent on the observance of proper standards of care by those with a significant degree of control over their lives. Schools are employed to educate children, which they can only do if they're allowed authority over them. That authority confers on them a significant degree of control. When the school's own control is delegated to someone else for the purpose of performing uh, part of the school's own education function, it is wholly reasonable that the school should be answerable for the careful exercise of its control by the delegate. So we need to look at not whether, whether the appellant was in control of the premises and the environment, but whether or not there was a significant degree of control of the respondent for the purposes of per performing the dental treatment, such that it can then be said that the that respondent was in the custody, charge, or care of the practice. And a similar point was made by 
Lord Justice Dyson in Farage at page 167. assumes without deciding that the hospital cases which identified a non-jailable duty were correct. Um, but then goes on to say, but I shall assume that a hospital generally owes a non-jailable duty to its patients to ensure that they are treated with skill and care regardless of the employment status of the person who is treating them, as explained in the Condis case. The rationale for this is that the hospital undertakes the care, supervision and control of its patients who are in special need of care. Patients are a vulnerable class of persons who place themselves in the care and under the control of a hospital, and as a result, the hospital assumes a particular responsibility for their well-being and safety. Well, the same is going to apply once the patient has been accepted for treatment, isn't it? Well, what I do say is that an important element of, of this case is that at the time of the actual treatment, it's agreed that the hospital had no control at all. The hospital? Sorry, the, the practice had no control at all in relation to any of the clinical decisions that were made by the associate. So in respect of the dental treatment itself, the practice had no control at all. And, and but it's about control over the patient, isn't it? It's not about control over the environment or the person who's doing the work. And, and unlike in a hospital, there wasn't any control of the patient in respect of, of that. The only control that the practice had was in relation to the administrative functions, and that's it. I had no control of the patient in relation. It's agreed there was no control of the patient in respect to the dental treatment that was in fact provided. That was entirely... I go back to my question about hospital outpatients. And I, I ask that deliberately. The hospital cases, as um, cited by the assumption in Woodland and by Lord Justice Dyson and Carroll, don't are not confined to accident and emergency or, or where a patient's unconscious or or incapable of, of making decisions. It seems to me it's, it's, there's nothing in them to indicate that they, the, the, the principle articulated by Lord Justice Denning in Cassidy, and now approved by uh, Lord Assumption, it is confined to patients who are um, incapable of walking into a clinic deciding to walk out if they don't like what they're told and so on. I, so I, I, I think it's quite difficult to distinguish the, the hospital cases. In, in, why is the degree of control of a um, consultant or registrar in a, in a hospital over the, over the patient any greater than the, the degree of control of a dentist uh, 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 over a patient at Manor Park. The key difference, and if you turn to page five of the supplemental bundle, that whereas we've just identified that the uh, in the hospital cases, the hospital undertakes the care, supervision and control of its patients who are in special need of care. In this case, if you look at point H.5, point, uh, it was an agreed fact that each of the associates had complete clinical control over the dental treatment provided to the claimant at each of their consultations. But the same would be true. So sorry. No, you're going to make the same point. <laughs> I bounce my 
<laughs> exactly the same. I mean, take the surgeon in the operation. It's exactly the same point. That surgeon, male or female, has complete control over the procedure when in that operating theatre. There's no difference. Except the hospital still has control of the surgeon in respect of things like appointments, measuring uh, their performance, things like that. There is no, there is no such control in the respect of the, of the practice. Well, if you're just saying, if you just look at what you said in eight point five, had complete clin clinical control over the dental treatment provided to the claimant, that is exactly the same as the treating clinician in a hospital, in a theatre, on a ward. My lady, I, I don't think I can, I don't think I can say any more in respect of issue of, of custody and control. No. I don't think it's your strongest point. All right. We're, we're, well, then, let, 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 we can deal let's with the, move on. We, we can, and dealing with the, the uh, last two matters, which were the first factor, as I've already indicated, the consequent, the issue of the first factor depends on the determination of the issue as to whether or not he'd assumed a responsibility in respect of providing dental treatment. Uh, and turning to the third factor, uh, again, I don't think I can usefully add anything to the submissions in my skeleton argument unless the court has any questions in relation to it. All right. So uh, that just leaves the question of vicarious liability. It does. Um, in, in relation to this, there are two elements to a claim in re relation to vicarious liability. It's only the first of those being the nature of the relationship with the alleged tort visa that's an issue in this case. Uh, and so we do accept that the judge was entirely correct to focus on the test set out in Barclays Bank. Uh, but before we get there, I think it is appropriate to consider the five policy incidents that were set out by Lord Phillips in the Christian Brothers case at 253. They aren't the test, they're just the reasons for the test. Absolutely, they're the policy reasons behind at uh, the test. Uh, uh, and as we can see from that decision, in fact, they weren't the reasons that he used. Um, his conclusion was based on looking actually at the, um, uh, the elements that were consistent with an employment relationship and the elements that were not. Uh, and there is one relevant section that uh, paragraph 36 where he deals with the significance of control. And he says this, in days gone by when the relationship of employer and employee was correctly portrayed by the phrase master and servant, the employer was often entitled to direct not merely what the employer should do, but the manner in which he should do it. Indeed, this right was taken as the test for differentiating between a contract of employment and a contract for the services of an independent contractor. Today, it's not realistic to look for a right to d direct how an employee should perform his duties as a necessary element in the relationship between employer and employee. Many employees apply a skill or expertise that is not susceptible to direction by anyone else in the company that employs them. Thus, the significance of control today is that the employer can direct what the employee does, not how he does it. And then, uh, looking at 391, Three nine one, paragraph twenty. Sorry, so we're moving out of Christian practice. Moving away from uh, the Christian Brothers case to Barclays Bank. Oh, yeah. Now this is. Um, I just raised this because it's a convenient way of of looking briefly at the case of Cox, where. Baroness Hale commented on the decision in that, uh, and um, it's fair to Baroness Hale notes as follows, it's fair to say Lord Reed uh, did focus on the five policy factors identified by Lord Phillips. He pointed out that they're not all of equal significance, and refers to factor one, deep pockets is not in itself a principal reason for imposing liability, although the absence of any other source of a compensation may sometimes be taken into account. And then factor five, control, 
does not have the significance which once it, it did. In today's world, an employer is likely to be able to uh, tell an employee what to do, but not, uh, but not at least always how to do it. But the absence of even this vestigial degree of control would point against liability. And then uh, note the three uh, remaining factors and the summing up at G of Lord Reed, where he said, the result of this approach is that a relationship other than one of employment is in principle capable of giving rise to vicarious liability, where harm is wrongfully done by an individual who carries on activities as an integral part of the business activities carried on by a defendant and for its benefit, um, rather than his activities being entirely attributable to a conduct of a recognizably independent business of its own or a third party, and where the commission of the wrongful act is a risk created by the defendant by assigning those activities to the individual in question. So, um, that uh, and the relevance of that is that that's the reference to integral part of the business activities. We can see that that is taken from one of the five policy factors. So that is uh, why he concluded the issue of the whether or not it was an integral part of the business was relevant. Uh, and just to be clear, in this case, I say it's not necessary to consider Lord Phillips's policy reasons because the correct approach is to focus on the question of whether or not the relationship was sufficiently akin to employment. Yes. And uh, if we then turn to 392 and paragraph 22, having considered Cox, Baroness Hill, uh, Conclude at the end of that paragraph, there's nothing in Lord Reed's judgment to cast doubt on the classic distinction between work done for an employer as part of the business of that employer and work done by an independent contractor as part of the business of that contractor. And then finally at 393, paragraph 27, the question therefore is, as it has always been, whether the tortfeasor is carrying on business on his own account or whether he is in a relationship into employment with the defendant, and then confirms that it's only in doubtful cases uh, where the five incidents may be of assistance, and finishes at the bottom of that paragraph with, where it is clear that the tortfeasor is carrying on his own independent business, it's not necessary to consider the five incidents. So the reality is that uh, uh, under the correct approach of akin to employment, the distinction remains between work done for an employer as part of the business of that employer and work done by an independent contractor as part of the business of the contractor. And it's important to consider where on that spectrum, between factors pointing one way and factors pointing the other, a particular case lies. And as noted at paragraph 27, the distinction is between whether the tort fees was carrying on business on his own account or whether he is in a relationship that's sufficiently akin to employment. Those are the two um, alternatives. So the question then needs to be asked, well, what are the characteristics of a relationship of employment in order to then be able to consider whether the facts of this case are sufficiently uh, akin to that? And some assistance was provided at page 215 in E's case, uh, where Lord Justice Ward uh, said as follows from sixty four. If, as I believe, it's necessary to attempt to capture the essence of what, is, what it is that makes a man an employee, I must examine both differences in more detail. Generally speaking, an employee works under the supervision and direction of his employer. An independent contractor is his own master, bound by his own contract, but not by his employer's orders. An employee works for his employer. An independent contractor is in a business on his own account. And then uh, refers to three conditions identified in the case of ready-mixed concrete, which were 
The servant agrees that in consideration of a wage or other remuneration, he will provide his own work and skill in the performance of some service for his master. He agrees expressly or impliedly that in the performance of that service, he will be subject to the other's control in a sufficient degree to make that other master, and the other provisions of the contract are consistent. But of course, you, you can, the associated dentists are not employees. That, that's that's accepted. Yes. Uh, that's not that's not the end of Mr. Collins's case, but you you, you probably don't have to go back to the famous uh, uh, judgment of Mr. Justice McKenna in Reading against Concrete. Well, I, I just go to this at two one eight at paragraph seventy, which is where Lord Justice Wall distilled the essence of all of that into one, a single sentence, and he said this at the end of paragraph seventy. Distill it to a single sentence. I would say that an employee is one who is paid a wage or salary to work under some with only slight control of his employer and his employer's business for his employer's business. The independent contractor works in and for his own business at his risk of profit or loss. So, with that as the background, I then do turn to uh, the approach of the judge in this particular case, and that's at page 94 of the core bundle. Um, the E case, Lord Justice Ward, paragraph 62, is, is where the, the, the phrase can fairly be said to be akin to employment. He, 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 was, he was the inventor of that phrase, wasn't he? That's correct. Which then crops up in, in subsequent. And has subsequently been confirmed that that is correctly the test. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, Looking at 94, page 94 of the core bundle, how the judge dealt with this issue. So having set out what we accept is the correct legal test, the judge then set out at paragraph 124 the factors that were consistent with the associates being independent contractors. And then... <laughs> At 125, she dealt with the issue of control. And at 127, uh, she listed factors that were relevant to her conclusion that the associates were integral to the appellant's business. So the first criticism I make relates to the judge's approach at paragraph 124, and in particular that she failed to take into account and uh, give uh, appropriate weight to all of the factors consistent with the associates working in and for their own business not in and for the appellant's business. As I've indicated, it's only if you consider all of the factors, or all of the relevant factors, that you can reach a conclusion as to where on the spectrum a particular case lies. Um, I, I, as you'll have seen from my skeleton, I've set out what we say are the relevant factors at hmm. paragraph 72. And just to clarify, I say I had to set them all out because I say that it's necessary to take all of them into account when making a decision. But um, what I propose to do is just identify the key factors that I say were specifically not taken into account. So the, the first is that it was uh, that there was a license fee payable. And I've already taken you to the relevant part of the judgment. Um, but it, it's page 73 in paragraph 39. where in the middle of that paragraph, she specifically notes, in consideration of the license provided by the agreement, the associate would make payments to the practice owner in accordance with Schedule 2. Now, the reality is that as the appellant collected the sums initially, that meant payment of a net sum after deduction of the fee to the associates. But I, I do say that, that the existence of a license fee is a significant factor that's consistent with the associates running their own business. And that wasn't included in paragraph 124. In fact, it was only included or any reference to the issue of payment was referred to at paragraph 125 and 5. Sorry, 125 and 4. And in fact, it was used as an argument in the other direction, it was suggested that the associates were in some way subject to the defendant's payment 
um, arrangements. Well, well, I say the starting point must be that it was a mutually agreed contract, so it was agreed by both parties that those should be the payment arrangements, but in any event, she clearly didn't take into account the fact that there was a license fee payable. That's the first point. The second is, uh, that although it's entirely accepted that the uh, appellant's business, being substantially larger than each of the associate's business, bore the majority of the financial risk uh, and the risk of potential and the benefit or the potential profits, the important point is that the associates were still responsible for key business decisions that affected the profit that they may make and were at risk as to both profit and loss. The fact that the appellant faced a greater risk does not avoid the fact that the associates fell squarely within what I say is Lord Justice Ward's description of an independent contractor working in and for their own business at his own risk of profit or loss. So the, the crucial point is that they were in fact facing the risk of both profit and loss. And that wasn't taken into account. In fact, again, it was taken into account in the opposite direction because of the majority of the risk being the practice. The third do, do, do they really have a... Um, what, what's the financial risk that they run? Yeah, as you pointed out, they they were free to work as much or as little as they wanted to. Um, like Uber drivers, one might say. Um, they have some, but not much, fixed cost. They have to, they have to have their professional indemnity insurance as a condition of being able to practice at all. And they have to meet their own expenses, paragraph 27, of accountancy and CPD, clothes and journals and so on. But otherwise, they haven't really got fixed costs, have they? Well, w one of the fixed costs of their business is paying the license fee, but that is dependent on the amount of work they yes. do. It's not fixed. Yes. It, it, it's, not a, it's not a fixed cost. No, it, but in respect of any particular yeah. item of work, if we just look each, at each individual item, because of the way that the charging worked, if, for example, an individual didn't pay for the treatment and lab fees of a particular sum had been incurred, he'd bear the half of the lab fees Yes. and yet would therefore be at risk because he's also bearing half of the, of the bad debt. So the... To that extent, there is a risk, both of profit and loss, to each of the associates. It's absolutely correct. It's, it's not as significant as uh, that borne by the practice, not least because the practice is a big, bigger business entity. But if we imagine the costs associated with an accountant, indemnity uh, cover and so on and so forth, providing his own professional clothing, all of those other costs, depending on the amount of work that he did or didn't do, that would affect whether or not he, at the end of the year, suffered a loss or earned a profit. The uh, third of my factors relates to uh, what was found at paragraph 38 on page 73. Uh, and we been through that, but again, as a result of uh, the decision not to include a UDA commitment, there was no obligation on the practice to provide any work to any of the associates. And uh, if we turn to paragraph 94, sorry, paragraph 124 at page 94. The judge did take into account the fact that they had uh, what was described as a large amount of freedom as to how much work they did. In fact, I say it was complete freedom from, from zero to, to any amount of work. But 
Um, then notes this, whilst it's not necessary to establish the kind of irreducible minimum of mutual obligations found in employment contracts, I accept that this degree of freedom casts some light on the nature of the relationship and could, depending on the impact of the other features I will come on to discuss, be an indicator that the associate dentists were independent contractors, albeit that it is not a decisive factor, a decisive indicator of that. So what I say is just as their freedom to do no work at all was accepted as a decisive factor, I say the freedom on the practice to provide no work at all is also a relevant factor. Uh, the fourth point is that although the judge was correct uh, in paragraph 123 to note that the, uh, that the fact that the associates weren't legally entitled to benefits that are only legally payable to employees doesn't assist one way or the other, what I do say is that she failed to take into account the fact that there was an absence of any provision in the contract for whether it's holiday pay, sick pay or pension. Um, that fact does make the relationship more like one of the associates being in business on their own account and less akin to employment. And that should have been taken into account. Uh, and the fifth point is that the, uh, the fact that the associates were obliged to have their own indemnity cover and that the appellant at the relevant time had no indemnity cover at all in respect of their work um, and the fact that the associates were obliged to indemnify the practice for any liability arising under their negligence. Uh, I say all of those factors are more consistent with them being in business on their own account. I may have missed it, but of that last point, the indemnity insurance, is that a matter the judge took account of or specifically didn't take account of? Well, she hasn't taken it into account in... She hasn't in 125, no. Or in 124 was where she seemed to be listing the factors which I was suggesting should point in a particular direction. Yeah. And I say that, that, that each of those points are important and particularly put alongside the fact that the associates had the right to do no work at all and the fact that they had complete clinical control over any work they in fact did uh, were strongly supportive of the fact that the associates were in business on their own account. So that's the first error that I say was made by the judge. The second error, I say, relates to the fact that in relation to the issue of control, um, as dealt with in paragraph 125, uh, she appears to have treated it as effectively a threshold test that was either met or not met, and that as long as there was some element of control, that was sufficient, and that could then be put to one side. Uh, and in particular, uh, she said uh, as follows uh, at the start of 125, um, as regards the degree of control that the defendant had in respect of the associate dentists, it's clear that the latter were free to make clinical decisions and provide treatment as they saw fit. As I've just noted, they, had a large, they also had freedom over how much they chose to work. Nonetheless, a relatively slight amount of control may suffice for these purposes. And then she referred to a number of paragraphs. And she says, I consider that a sufficient degree of control was present. In this regard, I note the following in particular. And the point I make is that it's not a question of just trying to identify whether or not there is this threshold of a sufficient degree of control. What's important is to consider all of the matters suggestive of control, but also importantly, all of the matters suggestive of no control, and, and then put all of those matters into the mix when deciding on akin to employment. But just to go back to the paragraphs she refers to, I think actually there's a mistake in the paragraph references. So they should in fact be referring to paragraphs 80, 81, and 84. Uh, 
Yes. Uh, there, there are two versions of this judgment. Um, uh, on Bailey, the paragraph numbers are slightly different from the 10 onwards, but never mind. Anyway, that, that may be where the, I think, where I think the trouble was, comes from. I think it was corrected. A, um, but 80 to 80. For our purposes, it's 80, 81, and 84. Yes. And, and so looking at paragraph 80, say that the judge has taken the, the words, if only slight, from the quotation from Lord Justice Ward in paragraph 80 and wrenched it out of context. That, that if, 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 you're, if the individual is paid a wage or salary to work, um, then the degree of control may, required may not be very great. Um, the associate dentists were not paid a wage or salary, so that sentence is not very helpful. That's correct, and, and in relation to the, the sections that I've already identified, there was a reference to there being a requirement for at least vestigial control, and it appears that that is what has given rise to the judge's approach. And, and it's right that the authorities do support the proposition that there needs to be at least a minimum for it still to be properly uh, at least potentially describable as a uh, akin to employment. Uh, and I do say, in relation to that, that on the facts of this case, there isn't even the vestigial element of control. So that y y there is a minimum requirement, that, that isn't the end of the question, but there is a minimum requirement. And the facts of this case don't meet that minimum requirement. They could uh, choose to do no work at all. They could choose what work they did. They could choose to work for another practice if they wanted. And crucially, the uh, practice had absolutely no control whatsoever in relation to any of the dental treatment that they provided. And if we go back to paragraph 125, which is where the judge dealt with the issue of control, I, I say looking at each of those matters raised at 125, all of those matters are, are matters that were simply necessary in order to allow the appellant to protect its own business interests, such as requiring the associates to comply with obligations under the GDS contract. Crucially, they're not the sort of managerial control over matters such as quality of work, performance, productivity, that are envisaged by the authorities. And in any event, I, I do say looking at those matters, they fall a long way short of there being control over what the associates did. Not how they did it, but it falls a long way short of there being control over what the associates did. So I think that deals with my criticisms in relation to the issue of control and how it was approached by the judge. Uh, the third criticism uh, relates to the judge's approach to the issue of whether the work was an integral part of the appellant's business. Uh, and I've uh, got two points to make in relation to that. The first is that um, my position is that the appellant's business was a, pro uh, was a provider of premises and facilities um, and so it has to be accepted 
that in the absence of the associates doing the work, he would receive no license fees and wouldn't be able to enter into the contract with the GDS. So that, that has to be entirely accepted. But the, the, the second and, and more important point is that again the judge appears to have used uh, effectively a threshold test as to whether or not uh, this requirement was met. And also has gone further and appeared to have concluded that if it's met, then it had some special value such that if met, it was effectively determinative of the relationship being akin to employment. Because if you turn to page 95 in paragraph 126, she said this. In my judgment, the most significant question for present purposes is whether the associate dentists were working as part of their own independent businesses or as an integral part of the defendant's business when they provided dental treatment at the practice. So it appears from this that she concluded that if it can be said that the work was an integral part of the defendant's business, then it would follow that the associates weren't working as part of their own independent business. That was the choice that she set herself in that section. As already indicated, the reference to an integral part of the defendant's business comes from Lord Reed and Cox, uh, which was in turn based on Lord Reed using the five criteria, which um, have since been identified as not being the correct test. The correct test is the correct test set out at paragraph 27 of Barclays Bank. And that doesn't define the test in the way um, that the judge did. Applying that correct test, the correct distinction is not between whether the associates were carrying on their own business or working as an integral part of the appellant's business, but whether they were carrying on their own business or in a relationship akin to employment. That is the correct distinction to apply. And I do say that it's easy by to see how by asking the question in the way that she did at paragraph 126, the judge mistakenly equated working as an integral part of the appellant's business to a relationship akin to employment. It's also easy to see how having posed the question in the way she did, and having concluded that the associates were doing work that was integral to the response business, it would inevitably follow for her that she would have to conclude the associates were not carrying on their own business. Again, I say that was wrong. The associates could both be carrying on their own business and doing work that was integral to the appellant's business in the sense of being of benefit and importance to that business. Now, undoubtedly, and I entirely accept, the level of benefit and the level of importance of the associates' work to the business was an important factor that should be taken into account. But it's just one factor among many uh, that should be taken into account when working out where in the spectrum this case lies. And then that leads me to the final ground of appeal in relation to vicarious liability, uh, which is that we do say that applying the correct test of whether the associates were carrying on their own business on their own account or whether they're in relationship akin to employment, the judge was wrong to conclude that they were in a relationship akin to employment, as I've indicated. This involves a balancing exercise between all of the factors pointing one direction against all of the factors pointing in another direction. And then, having done so, making a determination whether or not the relationship was sufficiently akin to employment for it to be fair, just, and reasonable to impose liability. Obviously, carrying out that test correctly requires all relevant factors to be taken into account. And I've dealt with that in respect of ground one. It requires that a threshold test shouldn't be used for the issue of control, which is ground two. Sorry, I'm just looking at something else. You go back to number one. In order to apply the test correctly, which is balancing all of the factors pointing in one direction against all of the factors pointing in the other direction, and then deciding whether or not the relationship was sufficiently akin to employment for it to be fair, just, and reasonable to impose liability, requires all factors be taken into account, 
uh, and I've raised our concerns and objections to the judge's decision in respect of ground one in relation to that. It requires that a threshold test shouldn't be used in respect of the issue of control, which is ground two. And it requires the issue of whether the associate's work was integral to the appellant's business to be treated as just one of the factors to be taken into account, as opposed to essentially the determinative factor that confirmed that they weren't working in business on their own account. And I say that applying that correct test correctly, the judge should have concluded that the associates were carrying on their own business and weren't in relationships akin to employment. Thank you. Um, I think my lady has a question. It, it's simply to ask you, uh, Mr. Davy, over the short adjournment. My lord raised um, what seems a little time ago now, uh, when we were looking at the GDS contract, whether there was a specific clause um, which permitted other dental practitioners to do the work. If you just check that one out over lunch, there was well, I can say it's implicit in part 12 and clause is 184 onwards, but um, for myself, I haven't quite found that clause yet. Um, what, we're, what we'll do, uh, Mr. Bailey, is we'll rise now to 2 o'clock. Um, uh, if you want five minutes at 2 o'clock to take with things that you think of as one does over lunchtime, um, uh, uh, then take it. And uh, after that, uh, we'll hope to be shown the, uh, the personal treatment plan or a specimen of the personal treatment plan. Um, hope that you'll be able to uh, give us the reference, if any, that my lady asked for. And then we'll hear from Mr. Collins. Thank you very much. <laughs>